Okay, thank you so much. So good afternoon to all of our esteemed panelists and participants. My name is Julia Kennedy and I'm the acting director of the Indo-Pacific office um, at the US Agency for International Development, India Mission. On behalf of USAID, I'm so pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, perhaps needless to say, but yet I think in these days it is important to say, I hope everyone is keeping safe and healthy uh, despite all of our challenging circumstances with the pandemic. Um, I am really grateful for this opportunity to interact with you all today uh, for two key reasons. First, I really would like to congratulate the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and our KC partner states in Assam, Jharkhand, and Gujarat for their efforts and commitment to further the deployment of renewable energy in India, despite all the challenges we're experiencing recently from um, COVID-19, including the lockdown in India and its impact on economic activities. We've seen some extraordinary outcomes over the past few months, uh, particularly in the power sector, that really demonstrate the resilience and flexibility of the power sector in India. For example, during the nine minutes event that happened on April 5th. Um, we've also seen um, really impressive results like SECI concluding the first round the clock tender of 400 megawatts um, with a historic low first year tariff. The real time power market was launched on June 1st and several other key initiatives have been announced to support renewable energy um, like the amendments to the Electricity Act. The second reason that I'm really grateful to be able to be here with you all today is to reiterate the commitment of USAID to supporting India's renewable energy revolution and sharing India's experience and leadership in this area with other parts of South Asia um, through our new initiative, which is called Asia Enhancing Growth and Development Through Energy or the Asia Edge in this Initiative. Asia Edge is one of the key parts of implementing the US government's uh, vision for the Indo-Pacific where we are hoping to see free and open and prosperous nations throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Last month, um, the US and Indian governments organized the second ministerial meeting of the US-India Strategic Energy Partnership. This meeting highlighted the successful partnership that we've had so far in the renewable energy sector, primarily through the US-India partnership to advance energy deployment Sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. So I hope y'all can hear me. Um, more popularly known as PSD. PSD is, of course, implemented in collaboration with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, um, similar to today's webinar. So today's webinar being organized under the second phase of PSD. Uh, and your second phase of PSD, otherwise known as PSD 2.0, it's designed to help states take advantage of the economic, environmental, and technical benefits offered by renewable energy resources. For example, by preparing distribution utilities for the transition to a new energy paradigm and improving markets for private sector investment in renewable energy technology. The program has three interventions that I want to highlight for you that are separate, but of course, interrelated. First, there's an enormous focus on strategic energy planning. Um, the goal of this is to improve uh, renewable energy procurement planning by distribution utilities through a wide range of activities, but one of the key ones is by establishing robust demand forecasts, um, which this kind of tariff that we're going to discuss today would help to support. The second is through scaling grid-connected distributed uh, PV, which this co component will help dis distribution utilities realize the benefits of distributed um, RE resources. And finally, innovative procurement of renewable energy technologies. One important global issue with the deployment of renewable energy is its variability, seasonality, and location specificity. I'm sure a lot of the people on this call are probably well aware of this. India has decided to utilize solar power, the most abundant renewable energy resource in the country. Targeted efforts at the national and state level 
have helped in significantly reducing the cost of solar power and have accelerated its deployment. But this is leading to a large volume of power in the system during the daytime. A major concern for distribution utilities is that they must back down their other resources while still paying a fixed cost for them. On the other hand, increased awareness and sustainability concerns have forced large commercial and industrial consumers to look for cleaner energy resources. Depending on the size, these consumers are either looking for open access contracts with renewable energy generators or adoption of on-site rooftop solar projects. This further exacerbates the, the difficulties that utilities are facing. In minimizing the use of power when there is an excess supply of renewable energy can help utilities to further reduce the cost of power and will also help end users to meet their green power needs. Today, we are discussing a green tariff which is one of the ways through which this demand side solution can be enabled. I'm really pleased today that we have Mr. Amitesh Sinha from MNRE, Mr. Anand Kumar from the Gujarat Electricity Regulatory Commission, senior participants from Assam and Jharkhand, and our expert panelists discuss this novel concept. Identifying opportunities, understanding the various stakeholders to, to make the pilot. In conclusion, I would like to say that our many successes have been based on partnerships, on a shared vision, value, and trust. I look forward to continuing this partnership and working closely with MNRE, our partner states, and all of you to achieve significant results in support of India's clean energy goals. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, before we start our webinar, I would like to request all the participants to please switch off their mic and video and kindly switch on the mic and video only when you are involved in a discussion. It's a humble request. Our next session will be presented by Mr. Anurag Mishra and Mr. Ranjit uh, Chandra. Let me first introduce them to you. Mr. Anurag Mishra serves as the senior energy team leader at USAID India leading programs to deliver on the Asia as initiative of the Indo-Pacific vision of the government of United States. He has experience in implementing managing programs funded by several multilateral donors and bilateral agencies, including GIZ, FCO, DFID, EU, World Bank and ADB. He has a vast experience in clean energy, climate change, new emission development and urban planning. Along with him, we have our another presenter, uh, Mr. Ranjit Chandra. Mr. Chandra is a co-founder of Ngenuity, uh, which is a uh, partner to uh, which is partner to Pasty 2.0 RE program. Ranjit has an experience of about 15 years and has been working on renewables for about 10 years. He has worked on several aspects of renewables, including policy and regulatory advisory, financial analysis, and also several technologies like solar, wind, solar rooftop, and biomass. He did his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from and IT Nagpur. Um, before I hand the mic over to Mr. Mishra and Ranjit, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please share uh, your que queries in the chat box. Uh, we'll be answering questions at the end of the um, presentation. And if we don't get to your questions during today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow up afterward. So uh, I'm just sharing the presentation.
All right, so the final uh, slides are getting uh, loaded. Uh, let me just kind of begin. Uh, and, and again, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, this presentation is uh, largely to kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, present uh, the ideas which we have generated through this program, but then also kind of uh, lay and ask a few questions uh, which we can use uh, for our discussion uh, uh, during the panel. Uh, where we have a set of experts uh, involved in this. So uh, uh, this is going to be presented by me and Ranjit. So I'm just going to start with the initial kind of a context setting, and then Ranjit will present the analysis for the two states. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as we all know that uh, the technology development, the cost reduction, as well as the supportive policies have really accelerated the India's adoption of renewable energy. Uh, the past three years, the growth has been significant, around 25% of uh, annual growth on the renewable side. Uh, there is also a kind of a very uh, robust ecosystem, which is now available in India to uh, take forward the vision the government of India has set uh, to achieve 175 gigawatt by 2022 or 450 gigawatts by 23. While all this is happening, uh, we're also seeing that uh, the introduction of renewables and uh, increased share of renewables in the system is actually having a significant impact on the overall power sector and how it is being kind of uh, managed. Uh, and we have seen most of the states are kind of going forward in procuring uh, more and more renewables, especially solar and wind, because uh, they are kind of uh, very cheaper resources and very kind of established technologies. Uh, these are kind of also creating uh, major issues around grid integration and some of the other challenges. Next slide, please. So uh, if we were to kind of continue on this trajectory of growth uh, to come to 100 gigawatt by 2022, uh, we see there are three uh, kind of uh, major challenges. And the first one is the high quantum of uh, variable renewable energy system. We started with a very small base of percentage of renewables in the total capacity or the generation side of it. But uh, by achieving like 100 cent per gigawatt by 2022, we'll be close to 35% of total capacity, which is coming from renewables, which is very good. Second is by 2030, uh, uh, if we go forward with the future target, the solar and wind will be around sharing 15 to 50 percent of our overall generation during the day and managing this variability would require significant investments and it will become even more critical as more and more power gets uh, renewable power gets added to the system the second issue is uh, the demand supply dissonance where we see uh, the renewables the major renewable sources which we are looking into are largely solar and wind uh, are kind of uh, creating a situation where we don't have a kind of a, a demand uh, and the supply peaks kind of coming at the same time. So you will see uh, there is a supply peak, especially from the solar coming during the daytime, and whereas uh, the system demand is kind of uh, in the late evening. And this is again, uh, would require to be addressed either by moving the demand towards uh, when we have more generation or uh, shifting the generation and using it uh, when uh, the demand is there. The third uh, and another important issue is uh, the existing uh, uh, legacy PPAs. Mostly these thermal capacities which were contracted uh, to uh, kind of uh, based on the overall peak demand. But now because of the variable renewable energy coming on the system, uh, they have to be backed down. And when they are backed down, the fixed charges have to be uh, paid. And more and more they are backed down, the more and more fixed charges have to be paid to these uh, generators where you have long-term contracts. So uh, looking into these three uh, major challenges for us to kind of go forward with 100 gigawatt. Uh, next slide, please. India has uh, uh, actually taken a number of initiatives on the grid integration. And as you see that uh, uh, these are kind of a range of activities around transmission planning so that you have a better uh, transmission network, uh, a good set of standards for interconnection, uh, utilizing the existing resources or other flexible resources like coal uh, and hydro uh, and gas generation assets to support renewables. Uh, the forecasting requirements uh, for renewables are kind of getting more stringent. And then finally, the, the market speeds, which Julia mentioned, uh, which we just launched uh, last month, uh, are uh, kind of uh, important initiatives which are helping India to achieve grid integration. Next slide, please. But if you see uh, the, the range of uh, possible solutions for integrating renewables, uh, that's the graph on, uh, on your right-hand side, uh, 
we are currently focused on a number of things which are mostly on the supply side of it, where we're trying to address the variability uh, on the supply side of it. And the solutions which can be kind of drawn from the demand side, especially the middle one, the orange column in the load, uh, if, uh, which are kind of a more feasible and cheaper option compared to others or complementary to the other solutions, uh, we have not looked at them uh, uh, in a significant way. The second issue is uh, the two primary stakeholders in this uh, overall renewables uh, deployments journey are uh, utilities and consumers. And they're not really actively involved in addressing these challenges which I highlighted before. And if you see the solutions, uh, most of the initiatives are targeting the first challenge, which I laid the three challenges of variability, uh, demand supply resonance, uh, and as well as uh, the existing PPS. Most of them are kind of uh, addressing the first issue of the variability, and the other two are not getting addressed. Uh, we have seen some of the utilities have taken uh, efforts uh, to look into supply side efforts where uh, they have looked into creating a balancing loads like energy storage, but these are really uh, high cost long-term investments. On the demand side, uh, some of the states have taken efforts to uh, adjust uh, the uh, irrigation load uh, and move it to the during the daytime, which will kind of help us uh, uh, kind of absorb more and more solar. But the challenge with that is the irrigation loads are kind of seasonal and you would not need them uh, throughout the year. And that is where we have to also look for more solutions or better solutions which can help us integrate this on the demand side. And we have seen uh, in, in most of the cases, tariffs is one of a very kind of a effective tool which can be utilized to kind of move the demand uh, when the generation is there. And uh, it can really influence the customers and uh, the utilities operations in a significant way. And there are a number of examples how this is being done uh, in other countries or even in India for uh, the context of uh, other uh, grid management issues. Next slide, please. So uh, in, in the US, uh, there is uh, kind of a, a good experience of using green tariffs to support renewables, although uh, I will say that the context of the US and India are different and the use of the green tariffs uh, in, in the US context versus what we are discussing today in India are different, but definitely there are uh, lessons or things can be drawn from the US experience. As you see from the map the right hand side, uh, there are a number of states in the US who have actually uh, adopted green tariffs. And then uh, the one which are kind of a light green color or the blue color are the one which are in the stages of developing their green tariff program. So it's kind of pretty much uh, spread across the country in the US. And the way it can operate is uh, it offers uh, the consumers to go up to 100% of renewables uh, uh, through a special utility uh, tariff rate. Uh, these are optional programs, so uh, it's not mandatory to uh, participate, but it provides uh, an opportunity for uh, the end users to uh, use more and more clean energy. Uh, and these are offered by the utilities uh, through a regulatory approval process. And uh, what is happening through this is the large consumers, uh, especially the commercial and industrial consumers, are addressing some of their other requirements like uh, the need for sustainability or their own energy uh, goals. But they're also looking into the long-term uh, financial viability of these solutions, knowing that uh, signing of these uh, green tariffs for a long-term, uh, uh, at some stage, these uh, tariffs will become cheaper for them and uh, they will draw the benefit, uh, financial benefit as well. Uh, the three ways uh, which, uh, in which the programs are offered, the one is uh, kind of a simple uh, sleeved uh, power purchase agreement where uh, uh, the end user or the consumer will sign up with the uh, utility and utility will sign up with the uh, directly uh, through a, a renewable generator through a PPA. The second is a subscriber program where uh, multiple consumers will come together and subscribe to a part of a large renewable energy project and the utility will then sign this PPA with that uh, renewable generator. And the third one is which is more advanced and probably something which will aspire for as the markets evolve is more market-based rate programs where the wholesale market participation through the utility happens and the consumer benefit uh, through uh, the utility uh, buying that power from the market and supply their uh, renewable uh, portion of it. So uh, these are the kind of initial slides. I would like to now hand it over to Ranjit to kind of take forward the rest of the presentation. Over to you, Ranjit.
thank you anurag uh, good afternoon everyone so uh, we try to uh, identify the kind of tariff interventions uh, so as to promote uh, higher offtake of renewable energy if we compare with the current situation uh, under the current situation uh, the tariffs for most of the consumers is either uh, is flat and uh, uh, and have some kind of fixed capacity charges and a uh, few consumers especially hd industrial consumers have uh, fall under tod regime How, uh, however the existing tod regime do not uh, correspond to the uh, uh, future uh, supply curves i mean uh, the developing evolving uh, supply curves so uh, so uh, the tariff interventions so we, we try to identify tariff interventions from uh, short term horizon to long term horizon uh within the short term horizon uh, th there can be some kind of targeted rebates for uh, during the peak supply period for uh, some targeted consumers and the other one is having the second uh, intervention can be having a time of day consumption tariff where the uh, where uh, discounts or the cheaper tariffs during the day time or say let's say uh, re peak supply time available to all the consumers in a consumer category or a or to the all uh, consumers and uh, looking from the long term horizon uh, ideally uh, the supply of green tariffs should uh, should have uh, variable component uh, where uh, uh, to the consumers obviously uh, where the green tariffs vary across the day as per the as per their generation profile and balancing requirements and the next step of uh, evolution can be the real time real cost energy and uh, the uh, the Uh, interventions which we have highlighted in uh, green boxes these are what we are uh, addressing uh, calling them as green time of day tariffs and uh, next few slides we, are, we would be discussing about uh, these two uh, uh, interventions and in this entire process of evolution we see that green tod tariff concept as a little step towards the long term target of having real time pricing uh, you get the next slide please so uh, when we say green tod tariff uh, what do we actually mean so uh, here uh, we are advocating that uh, during peak renewable energy supply period be it in a day or be it in a season a uh, lower tariff should be uh, promoted so that consumers can improve uh, increase their uh, generation during that period now if you look at the graph on the slide you you can see that uh, red line is uh, represents the uh, re generation curve for uh, a combination of wind and solar power, uh, uh, pps and then the green curve actually shows the actual demand from the consumers now if you see uh, the uh, the during re peak time the gap between the demand and supply is very narrow but however if you look at other periods of time it is very broad so uh, in order to uh, enable consumers to shift their demand if we can have some kind of time slot which coincides with the narrowing gaps between the demand and supply and announce some discount which can encourage consumers to shift their demand from peak period to the non peak period or re supply peak periods now so similar concepts have advantages for uh, uh, different uh, advantages for each of the stakeholders to start with uh, utilities they can uh, save on the procurement to the discounts uh, save on their procurement cost similarly they can postpone their uh, need for investment in grid balancing especially expensive technologies like uh, chemistry based uh, energy storage and for the consumers it can provide an opportunity to for, uh, for them to save on their energy cost and if we look from wider uh, economy perspective this uh, higher generation and uh, lower cost can encourage economic activity and also we can expect uh, people adopting uh, electrical technologies to replace non electrical technologies like say uh, electric vehicles and uh, cooking and then we can also enable and uh, the these tariffs i mean the, the savings can also enable consumers to invest in more decentralized technologies which can help in balancing the uh, uh, i mean distributing the supply for example uh, 
ice storage technologies, which are cheaper compared to uh, chemistry-based technologies, can be deployed uh, by the consumers themselves. Uh, and uh, the home uh, smart home systems, which can enable them shift their loads, and it is actually available. Uh, it is actually cheaper compared to the other technologies available. Next slide, please. Uh, so, on one hand, we are advocating the cheaper tariffs during the RE peak supply period, and another, on another hand, we are talking about uh, we are uh, saying that utilities can save uh, energy procurement costs. So, as a first step, we try to identify how discoms can save their uh, procurement costs. And uh, in order to uh, do so, we have uh, developed three uh, scenarios. The first one where uh, the solar is introduced to the current business as usual scenario. And in the second uh, scenario, we have uh, uh, identified some scope for demand shift and try to understand the savings from the demand shift. And in the third scenario, we try to add some additional load during the daytime and see uh, how the procurement uh, uh, response, uh, the new procurement strategy would be like and what can be the savings because of that. And uh, we have done this uh, preliminary study for two distribution companies. One is JBVNL from Jharkhand, the other one is APDCL from Assam. And we have used one year data. Uh, uh, we have analyzed uh, uh, one day for each month, and uh, so 12 days a year, and then we extrapolated for the entire year. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is the current scenario for uh, APDCL, and we try. And uh, the data you see on the screen is from uh, 15th of April 2018. Here, uh, the blue portion represents the uh, procurement from mustard plants. These are predominantly hydro. And then the purple portion is about is uh, represents the procurement from thermal power plants. These are combination of coal and gas for the state of Assam. And the red portion signifies the purchases or sales to the IEX. The numbers you see uh, in the bracket is actually the exports to IEX, and the number uh, without brackets is the imports to the is the imports from the IEX. And here we see that usually the peaks happen during the evenings or uh, during the early uh, mornings. However, the daytime load is little lower compared to the other uh, times of the day, and uh, and these curves and uh, these curves usually uh, vary across the year. However, one common point is uh, daytime loads are daytime is not the peak time. That is where a large amount of solar can come online in very near future. And also, we can see from this graph that uh, now the thermal procurement varies. Somewhere from uh, 380 megawatt to 600 megawatt in a, in a day. Uh, next slide, please. So by now uh, for the for that uh, demand supply curve, when we introduce 400 megawatt of solar on that particular day, so uh, the new supply curve would look like this. So the green portion is uh, solar, the blue portion is mustard uh, plants. And the purple portion is thermal power plants. Now you can see the variation within the thermal power plants are increasing drastically. However, the uh, procurement from the other time slots remains the same. Now this variation. Uh, sorry, you, yes, thank you. And uh, so this variation has two aspects to it. One is the technical aspects where the grid operators and uh, thermal uh, generators sh should adjust their generation as per the new requirement. And there is a commercial aspect to it. The commercial aspect is that the distribution companies still end up paying fixed charges despite of uh, for the uh, for the same amount of energy, uh, the same amount of fixed charges despite of procuring lesser amount of electricity. Yogita, you can't see slides.
you can now see uh, the, the presentation from my computer. Yes, go ahead, Ranjit. The presentation is on. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so here we see that uh, thermal procurement, uh, the variation in thermal procurement will be very drastic when we have influx of solar. Now this is the slide where we are saying uh, uh, what would happen if uh, the demand can be shifted from say peak period. Here, uh, so when we say uh, uh, shifting in demand, uh, so we, by shifting in the demand, we can save electricity from uh, two sources. Uh, uh, one is IEX, which is the most expensive one. The other one is uh, the most expensive uh, thermal power plants. However, for the sake of analysis, we have used only IEX uh, uh, procurement from IEX to identify the demand, and we have shifted that load from the non-peak period, sorry, from the peak period to the off-peak period. Now you you can see the blue blue line, which corresponds to the previous supply curve, and now you can and uh, the purple portion about the blue line corresponds to the new demand. Now we can see the variation within the thermal uh, supply can uh, reduce. At the same time, we are, we are uh, reducing our sub, uh, purchases from IEX, thus saving some money from that portion, while we are economizing on the fixed charges. Now if we zoom in further uh, uh, from uh, uh, day curve, to the one hour uh, uh, time slot, this is how the generation stacks would look like. Uh, the, these generations, uh, the stack is around, arranged as per the merit order. The most expensive uh, electricity, uh, the most expensive the variable charges of a particular power plant it is, higher it is on the merit order. I mean, that is the last option to purchase electricity from. So uh, under the current scenario, uh, 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 we have purchases from uh, BGDPP and LTPS and IEX. And from uh, scenario one, where we are introducing solar, purchases from these most expensive uh, power sources have drastically reduced uh, to 10 megawatts during that particular period. Now, by introducing demand shift, we are uh, increasing our uh, uh, purchases from one, uh, one of these sources. Again, based on the merit order. Now, so uh, so far we have seen it in terms of energy and uh, megawatt. Uh, uh, this slide uh, represents the picture in rupees and uh, rupee uh, lakhs and uh, uh, per unit uh, costs also. In all the scenarios, uh, we we can see that uh, fixed charges are same. Uh, and change the slide, Ranjit. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Rajiv. Slide has changed. Uh, from uh, all the uh, fixed charges, from all the scenarios, remain the same. However, the variable charges are increasing and uh, sorry, decreasing and increasing. Now, in scenario one, the savings from solar is due to uh, savings in the variable charges of the thermal power plant and also uh, imports from IEX during the daytime if there are any. Now, if we move to uh, scenario two, our uh, variable charges would increase. However, our uh, purchases from IEX would uh, reduce drastically, and these are uh, and uh, these are where the savings come from under the uh, first scenario two. Now, this is a snapshot of uh, this analysis on uh, for uh, the entire year. If, if we look at the average cost, change the slide. There is some lag. I have finished it. Uh, so. Can you see this uh, updated one? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, here are the annualized figures. And with each scenario, from current scenario to uh, scenario one, scenario two, change one, one more slide. Yeah. Go ahead. This is so we can see the uh, reduced uh, uh, decreasing average costs in the current scenario for APDCL. The average cost of procurement is about four rupees three paisa. With solar, it reduces to four rupees. With Himanshu, we can further reduce it to three rupees ninety five paisa. And with uh, adding ten percent uh, of load during the daytime, 
we can further reduce it. Now the same thing, the same trend we can see for JB Venom also. The current cost of procurement is about 4.46. With solar, it reduces to 4.42, and with demand shift, uh, it further reduces to 4.39, and further reduces to 4.37 with additional load during the data. Now, if we convert these into uh, these savings into uh, rupee per unit terms, for every unit shifted to uh, uh, shifted from peak period to uh, day time period, the gain is about the savings are about 1.62 rupees, and these gains will increase to 2.53 rupees if uh, an additional load uh, were uh, could be added during the day time. And now the corresponding numbers for JBVNL is about 1.08 rupees and 2.8 rupees. From this, we can see that there there are some uh, change, uh, some considerable savings for the shifted part or increased uh, demand uh, during the day, which can be used to fund the demand. Uh, so far, we discussed about the demand side of the story. Now, sorry, supply side of the story. Now, uh, coming to the demand side of the story. So there are, uh, from our experience and our interactions with uh, several uh, industries and experts, we have realized that there is considerable scope for shifting the demand from peak hours to the daytime. However, the realization potential of this demand varies across the horizon. So we have identified few parameters uh, to see, to identify uh, the potential consumers for short term uh, horizon, medium term, and long term horizons. Uh, the first uh, parameter is avail I mean, availability of uh, our, uh, is the consumer having a TOD meter or a smart meter. Why these two meters? Because uh, these meters have the capability to uh, record the day, uh, day, time of the day consumption. And then uh, the uh, and uh, and the consumers who have load to be shifted. Uh, have load that can be shifted, and then the price sensitivity of the consumers. Uh, uh, higher the energy intensity of the consumer, higher their price sensitivity. And the final parameter is whether the consumers have the ability to shift the demand or not. Now, based on this, uh, we, uh, the uh, as a short term uh, for, uh, for short term, we have this regulated loads like uh, irrigation. And uh, and uh, then HD industrial consumers operating in two to three shifts, and from short term to medium term, all HD consumers and smart metered consumers can be brought into this uh, regime, and uh, they can also have uh, shift their demand. And in the long term, all the consumers are potential consumers with new technologies and uh, uh, increased awareness. So to uh, so. To design uh, uh, successful T, uh, green DOD tariffs, uh, the three major pillars are consumers. One, number two, quantum of incentives to encourage consumers to make this behavioral change, and the third one is incentive structure. Uh, again, uh, consumers, uh, I have just uh, explained to you in the previous slide, and the quantum of uh, incentive. This is a uh, little tricky because we do not. We have uh, at least in India we have uh, limited studies and limited knowledge of how consumers respond to the uh, changes in the uh, tariffs. So, uh, so from uh, from the current TOD regime, it is observed that uh, uh, about one uh, twenty. I mean, there is a under the current TOD regime the difference between peak. Uh, peak uh, tariff and normal period tariff is about 20%. So this 20% has enabled few of the uh, consumers to shift their demand. However, we feel that with increasing uh, delta from 20% to say 30%, 40%, or 50%, we can encourage few more consumers or many more consumers to uh, fall into this uh, uh, regime and gain from it. And uh, uh, the incentive structures, as we have highlighted in uh, one of the earlier slides, uh, there can be three uh, incentive uh, structures. The first one is uh, giving targeted rebates to targeted consumers during the peak supply time uh, periods. The other one is having uh, standard uh, time of day uh, incentives, which are little different from uh, the current DOD regimes. 
and the third one is having the new consumption slabs where uh, which, uh, which can uh, promote consumers from consuming more i mean uh, this new uh, uh, the cheaper tariffs will kick in when the consumption goes beyond certain uh, quantum of electricity but in order in order uh, to succeed the green tod tariffs should be calibra recalibrated annually reflecting the uh, prevailing demand supply condition uh, one one of the uh, way, one of the ways which, which where this can be achieved is having this through uh, the regular uh, arr mechanism and the, here we have identified uh, try to identify few steps uh, from uh, the current uh, situation where we are uh, investigating uh, the concept at a preliminary level so to, um, to the overall uh, role of uh, the uh, the immediate step would be detail investigation to assess uh, potential for the savings where uh, uh, the savings for the discounts will be also Ranjit, your voice is coming very low. Okay. I'll try to be a little loud. Okay. Yeah. Decover this slide. Oh, sure. So, uh, this slide uh, present, we have identified few uh, steps from uh, the current stage where we are preliminarily investigating this concept to the uh, ultimate rollout of this concept. Uh, the next uh, step we see is having a detailed investigation into the uh, savings, uh, which, which can be which can be uh, shared with the consumers. And from the consumers' perspective, uh, a detailed survey with, uh, of the consumers need to be uh, carried out with an objective to identify potential consumers, potential loads, and kind of incentive which can encourage them. And then uh, uh, stakeholder consultation, where all the relevant parties sit together and identify appropriate incentive mechanisms, which will be minimum for every. And then uh, design of uh, green TOD followed by a pilot, and then based on the results of pilot, it will be the ultimate rollout. Uh, with this, I end my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anurag and Ranjit, for the great presentations. And now it gives me great pleasure to have our guest speaker, Mr. Anand Kumar, today. He is the chairperson of the Gujarat Electricity Regulatory Commission. He has a significant experience of over 37 years in Indian power sector, out of which he devoted almost 21 years in reforms, restructuring, and regulations. During his career, he has served four states' regulatory commissions in India, Besides, he also holds the post of Vice Chairman of the Forum of Regulators and Forum of Indian Regulator, and he is a member of the State Advisory Board of Apex Body of Auditors. Now I request Mr. Anand Kumar to please address the webinar. Good afternoon and uh, thank you, Yogita. First of all, uh, I would like to thank USAID for inviting me as a speaker here so I can share my experience uh, especially in Gujarat. So, am I audible? Am I clearly audible to you? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Please go ahead. So, okay. Thank you. So, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Ms. Kanedi, uh, Mr. Anurag Mishra, uh, Mr. Goyal, and uh, other esteemed guests I uh, see in the uh, uh, computer that there are large number of guests who are uh, involved in this presentation. So, uh, I think uh, I must congratulate the uh, persons who have been involved in the, this kind of study in two states, which is very relevant to all the states in the country. 
and as you have rightly pointed out, the major stakeholder in all this rollout is the regulator. So what I think that regulator along with the utilities, they should, you know, uh, make their efforts to, you know, uh, to cope up with this kind of transition in the power sector, which is coming in the country in a big way. So before I start, I would like to give you the present scenario of my state. And as you have pointed out in your uh, presentation, that there are a number of uh, steps uh, has to be taken by the utilities to manage the large integration of renewable energy in their grid. But I am very fortunate that uh, the Gujarat is such a state where all these kind of experiments are being taken up in the last three years. So I would like to brief you something upon that, and then I will give my vision for the next five years for Gujarat and as well as for the country itself. In Gujarat, we have the tariff structure, which has two part tariff, which is normally happened in all the states. And except residential, BPL, and the agriculture all have the time of use tariffs. There are discounts for use in night hours from 10 to 6, and for LT industries, waterworks, and other industries. Similarly, there are peak hour charges for two peaks like 7 to 11 a.m. in morning and 6 to 10 p.m. in night. And there are a special category of consumer, which is very, very important for all those states which have the uh, kind of variability in their demand and supply. There are exclusively categories which are using the consumption or they are using the energy during night hours only. They are not permitted to use the energy during day hours. So their tariff is just half of the normal tariff of the state. Like they have paying one third of the demand charges and half of the energy charges. So these are very attractive tariff where all the steel industries have gone for it. And they are saving their bills by paying very less amount of energy. And for that, we are having the demand curve, which is almost, almost flat. Like we have a variability of about 10% overall. Like we start, our base load is around 13,000 to 14,000 while our peak is around 16,000 to 16,500. So this is kind of, you know, uh, demand curve we have. So the second aspect, which you have already uh, touched upon about the irrigation load, because you know, in all the country, in all the states of the country, the agriculture load is about uh, 25 to 30% of their whole consumption. Similarly in Gujarat, there are 25 like, 25 lakh of consumers who are using about uh, 6,000 megawatt uh, energy for their irrigation uh, pumps. So what happened in Gujarat, we have regulated three shifts, like one third of the farmers get supply during eight hours, first eight hours, and similarly other two shifts for other two group of the consumers. So this way we are distributing the demand during the night hours also. Now, uh, at present, we have about 28,000 megawatt installed capacity in this state, which has about uh, 8,500 from renewable, and 6,000 is from wind, while 2,500 from the solar. And we have about 4,500 megawatt from gas-based, and the rest is from thermal, that is the coal-based plant. So since we are handling about uh, 25% of our load of renewable energy in a very smooth way. Our demand is not being affected by distributing the agriculture load. Now, what happened when uh, we are planning for next five years, where we foresee that our renewable energy will reach to about uh, 10,000 megawatts. Oh, no, uh, it will reach to about uh, 18,000 megawatts. So we are planning that by 22 we will reach 8,000 megawatt from solar, 8,000 megawatt from wind, and next two, three years then down the line, we will reach about 18,000 megawatt from the renewable energy. So this, this 
you know, this gives us a, you know, a trigger that we should now think of the study which you have already, you know, gone for. So, how we will cope up this? This we will try to cope up with only two, three, you know, two, three uh, uh, steps. Like uh, one is the, as I told you, that we are introducing a scheme which is known as Dinkar scheme. Dinkar scheme is nothing that uh, nothing but the farmers will get supply during daytime only. They will not be given supply during night hours. Like this will give them a comfort that uh, they have to come to the agriculture land only during the daytime. But with this arrangement, our load will shift from, you know, the peak hours that is uh, right now it is uh, evening, suppose 7 to 10. Now it will shift to the daytime. So daytime load will be around, our uh, load will increase by 30%. But at the same time, our evening, uh, night hours demand will also get reduced by about 20%. So that is a challenge for us to how to cope up with the night hours. So the second step, which you have also pointed out, that we should design our green tariff in such a way that energy, which is cheaper during daytime, is also being you know utilized by offering them an incentive in the tariff. So this can also be thought of. The third step is that we can you know think of some of the uh, incentive, more incentive during exclusively use of energy during night hours. So this can also be done. But my idea is that you have also pointed out that there should be a pilot study. There should be a pilot study done by some of the, you know, uh, some of the uh, distribution division to find out what is the pattern of their load for each category of consumer and what is the supply position in their state. So that the saving which you have pointed out in, in uh, Assam and Dharkan, if this principle is adopted by Gujarat, then there will be a huge saving because every day we have to purchase about 350 to 400 million units. So this is a great you know, expenditure uh, for the state. So if we reduce at least 5% of that, it will be a big relief for the consumers. So what I propose that uh, there should be a so what happened that in the last tariff order, we have directed our utilities to go for some kind of pilot study in their smart grid division. Because in the country, every uh, state has a pilot project which are dealing with the uh, smart meters. So we have given the direction to the uh, one of our company, distribution company, to go for this study and give their report on and their proposal for the green tariff to the commission for approval. So they wanted some time. And by that, uh, I think we have given them time up to September. But recently, I think day before yesterday, we got the proposal from them. And they have you know, gone for a very good study. They have taken all the category of consumer because in that division, the industries are very less. So we could not get the uh, uh, positive uh, data from the industry, but rest of the category like industry, uh, like commercial and domestic and uh, uh, waterworks, we got all this demand pattern. And this will give an, us an idea that how we should design our tariff in such a way that uh, the demand is shifted from uh, peak hours, the present peak hours, to daytime, so the 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 saving of the consumer's tariff can be done. And the third third aspect is also very important to use the energy during night hours when we have surplus because of the wind, because wind generally produces in the day, in night time, and the demand which have been shifted to the uh, daytime, that energy is surplus during the night hours. So for that, we are encouraging the electric vehicles in our state. The government of Gujarat is also coming up with a policy document for uh, promotion of electric vehicle in the state. And we are also uh, doing some study how to, you know, how to, you know, give incentive for the uh, uh, charging infrastructure 
uh, in a big way in Gujarat. So this will give us a, a good, you know, uh, feedback on the uh, next uh, five-year plan where we can, uh, you know, uh, use the renewable energy. So finally, I would like to share my vision for Gujarat, which will give you, you an idea that how the, you know, regulatory commission should react upon uh, this kind of situation in the country. Number one, what I gained from my experience in the last uh, 20 years of the regulation, I see that there should be a win-win for all stakeholders. Now, who are the stakeholders in the power sector? The government, the utilities, the consumers, and even the regulator. So there should be a win-win for all stakeholders so the power sector becomes sustainable and financially stable. In Gujarat, what I find that all the discoms, we have about seven numbers of discoms, which have earning a good profit from the last five years. So this is the situation when a discom is in profit, then only we will implement this kind of you know initiative or renewable energy or smart meter when you have money with your discounts then only you will be able to implement all these ideas the second second uh, uh, vision for myself is there should be encouragement for renewable energy growth in this state as i told you in the last uh, a uh, few years, we have tried to uh, match our targets, whatever targets was given by the Ministry Ministry of Renewable Energy. Uh, we, have, we are reaching to about 16,000 megawatt in next two years' time. For that, we have, you know, started competitive bidding aggressively. I used to get every alternate month or three months a proposal from my DISCOM to go for 500 megawatt to 1000 megawatt of solar uh, developer in the state. Similarly, on the same uh, side, we are also allowing a big amount of money in the area of the transmission company, so that transmission lines on the area where the potential of wind and solar is there, there should be a evacuation line. Similarly, 66 kV stations, substation, so as to carry the power to the consumer easily without any congestion. So we have allowed about 3,000 crores every year to the budget of the transmission company. The third is that the third aspect or the third vision for me is the conventional generation, how to protect conventional generation. So what we have decided in the last three years, I have personally, uh, personally followed that the old plant, oldest plant, which are about 2000 megawatt, we have retired. So the charges of the fixed charges of those plants are now not being passed on to the consumers and consumers are relieved. At the same time, we have also talked out a strategy that the plant, thermal plant, which are having, uh, which are have to use the socks for the environmental norms. So we are finding out whether they are financially viable or not so that they can run. So similarly, we have find out the number of plant where in the next five years, we have to invest some money. And we in the recent regulation, which are, we are coming up, we have given weighted to the uh, compensation to the conventional plant, those who are uh, 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 giving flexibility in operation and you know uh, having wear and tear on their plant because of uh, large, uh, large amount of ramping uh, due to wind and solar uh, variability. So we have provided that, them compensation. And the next and the last is the electric vehicle. We are promoting electric vehicle in the state in the near future in a big way. With this, I would like to thank you. And I, if uh, there is any you know, uh, uh, question or any query you have, you can you know, uh, take up in the last as Yogita told you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for sharing Gujarat's experience and uh, your vision with us. Uh, we are thankful to you for taking out time from your busy schedule and joining us today for this webinar. Your participation, contribution and support is extremely valuable to us, sir. Um, today we have an amazing panel on green tariffs, design methodology, potential role in uh, RE rich environment and opportunities for the Indian power market. 
Uh, before requesting Mr. Anurag Mishra to moderate the panel discussion, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel members. To begin with, our first panelist is uh, Mr. Bharat Jairaj. Uh, Mr. Jairaj leads WRI India's energy program. He has been with WRI since 2010 and has been involved with the establishment of key programs and functions in India. He's also a senior associate with WRI's governance center and co-leads the Global Electricity Governance Initiative, EGI. Thank you, sir, for your participation. Our second panelist is Mr. Ashwin Gambhir. Mr. Gambhir is a fellow at Prayas, working in renewable energy, electricity regulation, climate change. He leads the work on renewable energy policy and regulatory research and advocacy. He also works on electricity storage and energy modeling. Our next panelist is uh, Mr. Ajit Pandit. Mr. Pandit is one of the founding directors of Idam Infrastructure Advisory Limited. He has more than 20 years of experience in dealing with varied aspects of energy and utility sector in India. Ajit is recognized by the industry as expert on policy and regulatory matters concerning electricity industry and renewable energy sector in particular. Our next panelist is Mr. Bhaskar Sarkar. Mr. Sarkar has more than 30 years of experience, out of which 24 experiences in power sector reforms and power regulation. Currently, he is the CEO of Tata Power Trading Company. He has vast and varied experience of working different organizations, including uh, Tata Tele Services, uh, World Bank, PwC, CESC, and Tata Power Delhi Distribution Limited. Our last panelist is Ms. Vibhuti Garg. She is an energy economist uh, working with Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analyst. Vibhuti has over 13 years of experience in the energy sector. Her recent work includes promoting sustainable development through influencing policy intervention on energy pricing, subsidy reforms, and clean energy and private participation in various areas of the energy sector. I would like to request everyone to be on mute except the speaker, uh, except the panelist. And uh, pan I request panelists to open their uh, videos and uh, open their mic only when they are speaking. Uh, to make it more interactive. So now I request Mr. Anurag Mishra to please moderate the panel discussion. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Yogita. And uh, again, uh, welcome all the panelists and uh, very warm greeting to all of you. And also, uh, thank you for your patience uh, so far. And uh, I'd like to kind of kickstart the discussion with a common question to all of the panelists. And as we have seen from the presentation, the, the core concept uh, here is to influence the consumer demand through a tariff design. Now, I'd like to invite your comments on, uh, based on your experience in the power sector, can tariff design be used to promote adoption of renewable energy in India? And especially when we're looking into these large amounts of solar and wind, which is going to come very shortly. And if you have any experience uh, around these themes, which you can uh, share with us, and second, if you have kind of some initial feedback on the concept which was presented, the green uh, TOD tariff uh, in terms of its applicability and effectiveness. So uh, each of you can take a couple of minutes to respond to this. And uh, uh, I'd like to start with uh, Bharat first, and uh, then uh, we'll go to uh, other panelists. Thank you, Bharat. Right. Uh, thank you, An Anurag, and uh, thank you to the organizers. Um, Right, so this is a, actually a, a really important topic, and I'm I'm glad many of us are getting more involved in this. Uh, you know, and and just to dive straight into your question, Anurag, um, tariffs have you know historically been a good way to uh, to signal uh, consumption, whether it is to incentivize or disincentivize uh, consumption of electricity. Now, um, now previously, you know, if you look back 10, 20 years we were all used to certain types of sort of load curves and utilities were used to a certain kind of planning. Everything was far more comfortable. Uh, but now, um, you know, and, and so typically you would have, uh, depending on which region you are in, in the country, you would have a specific sort of uh, peak and you have to plan around it. Uh, but what we are seeing now is very different type of consumer behavior and not, uh, not at all sort of common and keeps changing. Um, uh, Tamil Nadu is a state that we have uh, 
as WRI India spent a fair bit of time looking at. And, uh, you know, in Tamil Nadu, you see some days of the year, you see, uh, as Mr. Anand Kumar just mentioned, you see morning peaks and you see evening peaks. And then some days in the year, you see a very flat load curve, right? I mean, not even a curve, it's just a flat load. Um, now, of course, when you have flat curves, it, uh, it lets you sort of better uh, align consumption with the kind of RE we are talking about, solar and wind. Um, but uh, I think uh, sort of at the crux of this issue is um, getting better at understanding demand um, and being able to then design solutions that meet that demand and not the other way around. Um, so now when we think again of, of the likely growing demand for space cooling uh, that's going to um, happen or around uh, some of the new electric vehicle consumption that uh, we've been hearing about. Uh, I think what is going to, uh, what, what's going to be important to see is how much of that is going to impact daytime load. Uh, and uh, that of course will allow greater integration with uh, solar. And, I, and, and so the uh, reason I'm bringing these kind of examples is to say that really time of day tariffs uh, is the way to go. Um, and uh, uh, utilities, uh, that are doing this uh, right now, of course, primarily at industrial consumers. Uh, we have to sort of work with the utilities to see how it can be passed on. These lower costs of RE, the benefits of renewables uh, can be passed on to all retail consumers. So yes, I think this is, um, uh, to summarize, uh, tariffs are a good way to, uh, to trigger certain kinds of consumer behavior and also uh, TOD is definitely the right way to go. Thank you, Bharat, uh, for your opening comment. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Ashwin Gambhir. Uh, uh, you can share your thoughts on the questions I leave Yeah, thanks, Anurag. Uh, uh, firstly, thanks for having me. Uh, it was a nice presentation, and uh, uh, all the points are very well taken. I support what uh, Bharat had just said in terms of uh, it's the need of the hour. And uh, I would uh, present some of the experience that we've had in Maharashtra. We've done some very detailed production cost simulations at a 15 minute level. Also some utility finance uh, modeling. And that has uh, led us to believe that, you know, TOD tariffs, not just within the day, but also seasonal uh, variations within TOD are uh, going to be very important given the uh, variability in solar and wind is not only diurnal, but also uh, quite pronouncedly seasonal given the monsoon effect. So we had uh, uh, given suggestions to that regard, which are very similar to the kinds of analysis that you've shown. Uh, essentially, in the daytime, you get a rebate in in the e morning peak and evening peak, uh, you get a you get a, a penalty for consumption because that is when the battery storage is deployed the most. And in the night time, depending on the state and the utilities um, uh, already procured uh, uh, profile, uh, you know, if they have a surplus, then they could also give a rebate at the night time. Or uh, depending on if they are not in surplus, they could change that. Uh, uh, we also suggested a seasonal variation. There are four months in Maharashtra where the utility um, uh, is uh, stressed in terms of meeting demand. That is when open access uh, withdrawal is also uh, not allowed. Uh, so we had also made some seasonal uh, uh, modifications to that TOD. And finally, we had also suggested that uh, rather than keeping the threshold at 20 kilowatt consumers, we, the threshold be brought down to 10 kilowatts. On all three accounts, the commission has uh, appreciated this analysis and uh, accepted the spirit of uh, the recommendations going ahead. They haven't fully implemented it as yet. They have said it in the MTR process in a couple of years when the pet discom files the petition and when RE shares are more uh, increased, they will certainly consider that and the discom uh, they have asked the discom to look into this. So we are very hopeful that this will come about. Uh, one of the other things in Maharashtra, which is uh, which is leading the effort, is the solar feeder uh, program, which is what uh, Mr. Anand Kumar also mentioned uh, about their agriculture supply moving to daytime. So Maharashtra has a policy. Uh, there are already around 3,000 megawatts of solar which have been tendered, and that supply to agriculture will only be between 8 to 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we are going to get a very good. Uh, demand response or uh, demand flexibility in the form of agriculture, which is a low hanging fruit, and then go on to more sophisticated uh, 
uh, time of day for uh, not just industrial but also for residential where uh, especially on the ac side there could be some possibilities with with smart acs or smart appliances uh, that needs to be looked into maybe commercial uh, chillers can have uh, uh, much more uh, 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 much more scale uh, depending on the spread of the tod and the technology involved um, and some uh, Earlier experience from Maharashtra, even when the spread was uh, two rupees fifty paise for nighttime rebate, a lot of uh, load did not shift to the night. So that is also something to look at. And finally, I would say that uh, you know that spread of how much incentive to give uh, will need to be analyzed and dynamically changed because that will have to be a function which is an interplay on what are the market prices. So if your TOD spread is not aligned to what the market prices are, then the STOA short term open access consumers or industrial consumers would play between the market and the discount tariffs and even storage coming up in a big play. So we need to be very, very nimble going ahead. It's not just to fix a TOD and a seasonal TOD and that's it for five years uh, that uh, we expect the situation to be very, very dynamic. And so we need to be nimble in our regulations as well. So I'll end there in my opening remarks. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Ashwin. And I think very important points, uh, not to just look into the daily variation, but the seasonal variations are equally important. And your, your last point, I think that is something which is applicable for all the regulation which we are going into not to think about something which is very kind of a static. It has to be a dynamic process and which we've been seeing most of the regulatory commissions are now also getting into that. So uh, next, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Ajit uh, uh, to provide his kind of a uh, response to the two uh, questions. Over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks Anurag. And uh, at the outset, let me thank USAID, yourself, Anurag, and also the Tetratic team for uh, giving me this opportunity for interaction. Uh, having been associated with PSD 1.0 for five years, uh, it's been kind of a real makes me nostalgic and really a kind of a homecoming. Uh, having said that, on the specific questions that you had actually raised, am I audible? Yes. I see some kind of an echo. Yeah. Okay. If others can put themselves on mute, please. Yeah, go ahead, Ajit. Yeah. So uh, on the first point about uh, the tariff design can play a very important role. And as uh, we heard, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Anand Kumar, in terms of you know the regulatory intervention can play a very important role in terms of influencing consumer uh, behavior and uh, load shape to great extent. And in that sense, the TOD tariff does make an eminent sense. Uh, and I agree with all the points which uh, Bharat and Ashwin has made. Uh, uh, but I have uh, you know a couple of uh, other points to add to the discussion. Uh, the first and foremost is actually there are not very many studies about you know to understand the impact of TOD tariff on the on the uh, for both for the user as I mean, the consumer as well as from the utility point of view. The the one study that I remember uh, last is that the forum regulators did way back in 2012, uh, which had a reference to a you know couple of studies and for introduction of a TOD tariff. And there are a couple of you know suggestions and recommendations on that, but we have, don't see a much action on the ground in terms of uh, many states actually undertaking a very uh, scientific methodological study study to design and develop a TOD framework uh, mechanism around that. Uh, and those, some of those recommendations are still equally valid even today as we speak. Uh, uh, so in terms of what needs to be done or what can be done, uh, I would like to actually, you know, uh, uh, so to speak, you know, coin a word called ABCD of TOD. And uh, those A, B, C, D, four uh, dimensions or component. The first and foremost, the A part is the applicability to a consumer category A for applicability. And uh, as we see, from more than 17, 18 states already have you know TOD tariff framework uh, uh, in, in place, and almost all HT categories are always covered. But even in LT categories, whether it is 50 kilowatt and above or 20 kilowatt and above, uh, you know, uh, so deciding the applicability would depend on that particular state and utilities uh, preparedness and lot of homework needs to be done in that sense. The two states that you talked about in Assam and Jharkhand, to my knowledge, it is currently applicable in Jharkhand for only HT category and in in in, uh, in Assam possibly above 50 kV uh, and 150 kV uh, kind of in demand. So that's a that applicability decision point also uh, would involve a lot more, you know, exercise iteration and stakeholder consultation uh, process. The B part of it, uh, uh, you know, even if when you say that you're applying it for HT industry, the B is the most important thing, the buyer behavior. 
no even though you apply it for industrial consumer it's not necessary that you know the, all the buyers would actually fall in place because there is a element of behavioral uh, uh, element in terms of you know shaping up that load shape and we have to be really careful about and we need to have a very detailed consumer load surveys uh, to be you know what kind of because the uh, there are continuous process industries there are shift industries uh, there are quite a few other you know the industrial uh, consumers have aligned their entire inventory resources their processes uh, around it and it it would be uh, it's not possible when you show so show it in the in terms of graph that you can simply shift uh, you know the uh, evening peak consumption into a day time and uh, to that extent the behavior would play an important role and that should be also paid attention to uh the c part of it it's it's a consumption slabs uh, that is consumer slabs uh, that we're talking about the tod slab and then the 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 reference about that a for study talks about to start with the basic three categorization of peak off peak and normal but many states have even gone beyond you know in terms of five slabs or six slabs kind of structure and i see in your presentation in fact uh, you wanting to suggest even a further granularization of that uh, but that is something that we need to really look at uh, not just from the one source or one resource point of it's so, uh, basically how would that uh, you know play out you know there are you know uh, changes around uh, around uh, our boundary hours and then that there is a challenge for the utility also to manage that and uh, although we have a you know uh, sophisticated you know energy accounting and metering and softwares in place but still that could be an important role so deciding a consumer slabs and as uh, you know uh, ashwin said that we need to be nimble in terms of you know uh, 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 in, in terms of this dynamics but having decided the slabs at least through tariff order it would be valid for an entire year or so you not have uh, as many multiple slabs apps or dynamism within within that uh, entire year uh, so in that sense that consumer slabs uh, plays an important role and the finally the deep part of it is actually the entire design of the tod framework per se and there are various other aspects or dimensions of this design uh, right from you know what kind of a discount or a rebate uh, uh, or incentive framework that would uh, would talk about uh, or to the extent of whether mandatory or uh, voluntary participation for example as uh, ashwin mentioned in maharashtra you no know, below 20 kilowatt also there is an optional tod which has been uh, uh, offered for certain category of consumers uh, then the pricing part of it whether you need to have a, a symmetric pricing asymmetric or you know symmetric pricing uh, for the peak and off peak you know so those aspects need to be uh, thrashed out and you know a little bit more uh, uh, detailed study around because there's got a revenue implications for the utility because we have seen in maharashtra in uh, 2012 uh, when commission introduced uh, and in fact increase the night uh, rebate from 1.5 to 2 rupees 50 paise uh, there is hardly any change in terms of uh, you know uh, consumption uh, shift uh, didn't happen as much but there is a loss of revenue for the utility to great extent uh, so then again in subsequent in 2014 it was reverted back and uh, so those things is something which require a more systematic study in terms of designing this program and maybe i'll stop here right now in terms of abcd components of uh, tod tariff design thanks to jeet uh, for kind of uh, putting it uh, simple people there are a lot of questions which you raised and uh, i'll come back to that uh, those questions in the second round of uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, i'd like to now invite uh, mr bhaskar sarkar uh, uh, to provide his uh, on the two questions what do you want to ask good evening good evening anurag thank you and i would like to also thank uh, usa and uh, mr rakesh goel for giving me this opportunity to be present in this uh, subject which is very very critical for the country and i would uh, like to uh, take forward some of the points which has been already mentioned by my previous speakers and particularly ajit uh, this abcd which he has said is very well uh, you know thought thought of uh, uh, those points uh really uh, these are these have to be taken care of. but having said that uh, these are uh, done and the tariff design let's assume that it is it is uh, done in the best possible way uh, addressing all the abcds even then uh, with our experience of working very closely with consumers for for their open access uh, in the state in in almost all the states of india particularly up delhi and telangana and other states where we find that uh, you know the tariff uh, is not, it can be a, an environment which can be uh, created but you have to have enabling provisions you have to have to package it properly so that people are uh, you know get that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, that opportunity to 
uh, change their behavior, change their, uh, you know, uh, uh, their uh, usage patterns. And, uh, you know, I, I saw that has been also mentioned uh, in, the, in the presentation by Mr. Ranjit, where he has talked about some technologies or something which has to be adopted. So we are very closely working on, on uh, two aspects. One is uh, we are closely working with the IM led consortium, which is working on blockchain uh, technologies. And particularly uh, two things I'll talk about. One is the ESCO service which is very, very required to support, to understand the consumption pattern, the capital capital requirement pattern, the uh, uh, the uh, what what it makes or what it costs for the consumer to shift his demand. That is very, very important to give him that support. And also I I'd like to say that many consumers are very averse to, uh, you know, making investments. So uh, normally what we do is we bring in uh, uh, NBFCs uh, in, in support of uh, the investments which have, which have to be done to give them an enabling atmosphere. Uh, actually, that packaging needs to be done and that's very, very critical for the success of any TOD. And 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 that I, I would like to bring that uh, point on board. The second point is uh, also in, in addition to green TOD, there has to be some more, uh, you know, uh, uh, initiatives like demand response. Demand response, if anybody says, looks to be a very theoretical thing and everybody would uh, wash it off saying that it's not possible. But we have uh, seen uh, there is a new uh, blockchain based demand uh, response uh, pilot which has been successful in Delhi, which is uh, which is a very positive story. And and it, it is it is giving a very and very easy and uh, system based approach. Uh, and also very authentic and very trustworthy uh, uh, in approach which can really help uh, consumers to to uh, you know get that provocation to shift to demand uh, uh, to this tariff uh, modifications the other thing which i would like to say that uh, we have to also categorize the consumers like uh, whether it is at all required for uh, uh, consideration of tod for the residential or the for the subsidized consumers at all because the uh, subsidized consumers, the it's more important that they they move out of the grid, and we should enable their moving out in terms of uh, pushing the solar uh, rooftop solar programs for them, uh, giving them enabling provisions to move, promote uh, more and more rooftop solars, and also uh, you know some avenues for that solar solar uh, instead of getting into the grid at a lower price can that be used by other consumers so i'll touch upon more in in my subsequent points but i would like to initial remark i would like to say that we have to plan it properly we have to in, uh, envelop it properly and package it properly so that and also so give those supporting environment to the consumers otherwise this will be like any other tod which will be only a uh, only a tariff uh, which uh, may or may not be uh, adopted it's left to chance Thank you, Mr. Sarkar, and a very valid point that uh, the tariff has to be also supported by other initiatives which will help the consumer to adopt that tariff and uh, change it. Uh, now, uh, finally, I'd like to invite uh, Vibhuti and uh, her experience and your comments on the two questions I just over. Um, thank you, Anurag, for this interesting discussion. Um, so far, you know, uh, whatever discussions have been happening, I've been largely focusing on the supply side options. Demand supply side response is the particularly the low hanging fruit. And if we have the right market signals, one can tap this to balance and provide stability to the grid. So I'm glad we are here today discussing about, you know, uh, TOD tariff, which is one of the ways in tapping this demand side response. If we look at the current pricing system, it's largely flat, while there are uh, some states which have provided, as our different panelists and Mr. Anand Kumar also kind of talked about the various uh, TOD tariffs in different states, but you know there have been uh, some kind of bottlenecks in terms of what kind of capacities these TOD tariffs are applicable to, and the response being provided by different uh, consumer categories. So far, you know, uh, they have not been able to incentivize the consumers to respond to the supply curve to that extent. I think uh, in today's circumstances where we are adding more and more renewable energy um, and going forward, the share of renewable energy will be even more. We need a kind of a radical shift where 
supply kind of matches demand we have a uh, so far it's largely been supply matching demand but wherein demand can follow the supply curve so that we are able to shift the demand to the time when re is available more and how do you make that possible and one of the ways as we have been discussing is through green uh, tod tariffs we need change in market design and introduce more products whether it's in the short term or you know in the long term in terms of time of day tariffs which can help not only manage peak demand but also provide a better deal for consumer i was personally involved in one of the studies which i did from icf along with indian energy exchange in jaipur few years back wherein we invited few industries to provide this demand side response uh to the distribution in this to the uh, company in their state um it was largely uh, catering to the industries which includes steel cement and paper and they um, i mean while we have largely seen industries being reluctant but we were very surprised and you know very uh, overwhelming to see the kind of response we received uh, uh, if the correct market signals were given so um if we kind of ensure that you know uh, there is a right price signal and which can help in these industry to shift their demand without any loss in production they were willing to sh do that shift from peak to off peak hours and when i say off peak hours it also coincides with you know uh, during hours when solar is largely available so i think uh, there is definitely uh, Uh, an appetite from the industries to respond given as i said you know if the signals are right uh, what we did was we set up a gprs based systems at the end of the consumer industries uh, um, in order to monitor the power demand and had another agencies to uh, act as a demand aggregator for kind of initiating the response uh, based on the trigger received from the distribution companies and then communicating the same to the industry but it all happened a day in advance i think um, now that time the indian energy exchange didn't have the real time product being available so all this was done a day in advance we did this pilot on four days including weekend to understand uh, different industries appetite for providing response and after giving the incentives they were saving to the discoms even after you know incentives were paid as they did save a lot of uh, uh power from drawing from the ui market so it it was kind of beneficial for the industries as well as the distribution company the um i think uh, so that was as i said quite positive to see industries responding to uh, the market signal um but that was a very small pilot done with few industries i think uh, as my other co panelists have uh, really pointed out there is lack of comprehensive data on the amount of energy consumed by different end users the kind of appliances they own uh, the load patterns of different consumers and end users the price sensitivity of different consumers and uh, other ne data needs that hampers a complete analysis of demand potential so i think going forward we need that kind of analysis to help develop a proper market design to tap this kind of uh, um, kind of a response which can help in grid stability i will end my uh, opening remarks here happy to answer any other things in the subsequent discussion thanks vibhuti uh, so uh, let me just kind of now uh, go back to uh, bharat and uh, ask uh, a little kind of a specific question about uh, wri's kind of efforts in tamil nadu you mentioned and i know that uh, your uh, program is being running uh, supporting the industrial and commercial consumers uh, uh, to achieve or, or adopt more and more energy uh, so uh, in your work in in the space for Tamilnadu and Karnataka, do you consider green tariffs as one of the option to kind of uh, increase the consumer to take more renewables? And also, uh, uh, what was the kind of a uh, renewable? The renewables used to be very expensive a couple of years back. Now it's kind of a uh, pretty uh, cheaper and uh, probably the cheapest resource uh, you know compared to the utility tariffs. So. Uh, Uh, other than the costing are there other uh, kind of uh, uh, motivation factors uh, for these uh, consumer classes to adopt more renewables and look into uh, a principle of green tariff where they get the benefit of uh, more renewables 
but also stay on the board of the yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, maybe my connection has just went uh, down a bit. But can you hear me? Sure. Yes, you can. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, uh, thanks for for that question. Yes, uh, we have been working uh, with a few Indian states, uh, uh, and uh, you know, as 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 you can imagine, when we think of green tariffs or renewable energy uh, with CNI consumers. Um, you uh, sort of begin to look uh, at South and West of India. Um, and so we've uh, tended to focus on uh, uh, on the same states. Um, and, and the issue of, I think, where green tariffs is particularly useful uh, in our estimation uh, was uh, where states are uh, facing the issue of curtailment of RE. Um, because here, you know, sort of potentially utilities can sell this surplus renewables to uh, CNI customers at a price um, discovered to the market or whatever set by the regulator uh, or, or you know where the regulator provides uh, guidance and of course in other uh, for other states uh, for instance Delhi or states that are net buyers of uh, of renewables you will need a different type of, of, of sort of solutions. Um, now um, the states we're working in Karnataka for instance uh, has already adopted uh, uh, green tariffs of uh, some kind since uh, since 2010 um, and the uh, rationale at that point of course was to um, uh, allow for industrial consumers to to demonstrate their uh, uh, green commitment um, and so they were required to sort of pay a, a higher tariff I, I think it was a, an additional rupee or, or 50 paise uh, over their uh, over their sort of uh, the industrial tariff they otherwise uh, would have paid, and uh, and and clearly, uh, industrial consumers did not see uh, much logic in that, uh, and they have continued to look uh, for options that, of course, make financial sense, uh, but also provide green benefits. Uh, and so, as as we as we all know, um, many have chosen uh, to go down the open access or the group captive uh, route, and so on. Uh, Bescom, I think, had another interesting idea in 2019 when they had a surplus of wind during the monsoon and they tried to get a sort of monsoon discount for CNI consumers, but that didn't move forward uh, because they had already got their uh, tariff revision approved for the year and this could have been a tantamount to a second request within one year. Um, Tamil Nadu on the, uh, uh, is another state you know, uh, that we work actively in. Uh, has hasn't uh, at all taken steps towards exploring green tariffs uh, so far. Now your sort of sec the second part of your question, you know, when 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 this thing was starting, um, what uh, you know, uh, it, we needed a certain model. But now uh, that renewable energy prices um, have have been uh, dropping, uh, what's the you know what's the sort of model? And uh, I think. Um, the the sort of this is this is the sort of tricky this is a trick trick a tricky part of 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 trying to solve this uh, set of situations and I agree with Ashwin and 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 uh, Ajit and others who, who say that what we need to be is nimble uh, and not lock ourselves into what looks like uh, the perfect choices today because uh, these could very quickly become suboptimal so we we have to think about sort of you know like a menu of options. Um, now, uh, uh, let me just say sort of two points, and one is more in the, in the nature of uh, of a principle. Um, and that, so, when when WRI began work on green tariffs, you know, this we we've, we've uh, first started this work in the U.S., then in in, uh, in 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 Europe, and so on. But we we were very careful to explore how these green tariffs would impact other consumers on the system, and this is this is true wherever wherever we try and introduce a particular type of of tariff, and it's very important to uh, that we understand the cost impacts to consumers who are not participating in the green tariffs. This is going to be a crucial factor to ensure that these programs are successful. So whether in, whether we do this at a time when renewable energy was expensive, or when we do it when renewable energy is cheaper, I think the the, the one of the guiding principles is to ensure that the cost impacts to consumers who are not participating the, in the in this program are taken into account, are addressed, and that consumers who are not participating are not worse off um, in the sense, you know, in, in our efforts to try and uh, a, a sort of uh, provide this option. And, and but, but I also sort of want to make a point that, uh, you know, the, the business as usual point 
uh, is does not uh, really help us because we do know across different states industrial tariffs will keep going up and renewable energy prices have been coming down and it's only obvious that as soon as it is becomes as soon as it makes sense whoever can will quickly move to captive or open access options but this binary choice is not a good place for us to be in and i think like mr arvind anand kumar talked about gujarat or we heard up from ashwin about uh, maharashtra what we need is uh, to start uh, opening up these sort of false binaries and start looking at uh, what we want to do for different types of consumers uh, those for instance longer term open access versus short term open access those who want to stay want to procure renewables how do you incentivize those who don't really care about renewables what are the options they need to be provided those who have captive uh, you know what do you need to provide uh, so on and so forth so i think this uh, this is uh, the that that i think the the important part is sort of staying true to the principles and then ensuring that whatever models we have uh, are are tested against these principles uh, otherwise uh, what will look appropriate today could end up uh, being very inappropriate uh, in in a very short period of time thanks uh, and uh, now i'd like to uh, move to ashwin and uh, one of the points that uh, the UV tariff has not acted or not really used to in case uh, you're referring to the Maharashtra case or maybe some other case. So uh, can you, based on your experience, talk about like uh, how successful these tariffs have been and how you can draw from that experience? For the design of green tariffs, uh, I know you mentioned already a few points that we have to be very nimble and we can be kind of uh, uh, proactively kind of adjusting these tariffs and all. But are there other elements uh, which one should be looking into based on the experience of uh, the TOD in, in different states? Over. Uh, I don't have any very particularly on a sort of a field experience that maybe Ajit or uh, Bhaskar could bring in. But okay. I would like to make, uh, make another point is. Uh, uh, unlike last uh, few years, which uh, Vibhuti also said, now you have the RTM product, you also have green TAM, and there's also talk of green dam coming in. So, like Bharat said, if you know Karnataka surplus in wind, it need not now only look at giving tariff based signals to its own consumers. Now it has the whole Indian market at its uh, fingertips to sell that excess in very different time scales. So, there is also now various options for the discom uh, and equally for the consumers also to to play into to the prices so i think that is the larger uh, uh, point and i i definitely take uh, this point that you know the just setting a tariff signal is not going to move consumers because consumer behavior is quite sticky especially in residential you need to actively pursue them and show them the value stream make it very very convenient even in rooftop we have seen in fact, many a times uh, we have read that people are willing to shift, even put in their own money, but the whole process can become so cumbersome that uh, they are not interested, you know, the delays in subsidy or uh, the amount of paperwork, so on and so forth. So I think that point is equally valid that one is how much the TOD spread should be, but making it extremely consumer and customer focused and easy for that customer to to see the value and participate in it. I think a lot needs to be thought on that front as well. And I don't think we have looked at consumer consumer behavior uh, from a regulatory point of view in that much detail at all in India with smart meters and smart appliances coming up. I think that aspect of research needs to be really looked into much better. OK, and uh, you are uh, kind of suggesting uh, uh, that we should be focusing more on a, a, a limited consumer categories or we should be kind of uh, thinking about the one which can quickly adopt it with limited support or already have the technologies to go for it, for example, having a smart meter already installed. And uh, the second question is, uh, if you were to go for this, uh, whether this should be kind of left as in a kind of optional for the consumer classes to see whether I want to participate in this or not, or should be just applied to uh, all that uh, consumers in that specific class uh, across the board. Yeah, I'll take the second one first. I think uh, at least from our side, we don't think that it should be optional. Once a consumer class is 
is designed as TOD, then everyone should be uh, have that because then you would say uh, opportunistic switching between the market and the discom depending on you know when you want to switch and not. So if it's there, it's there for everyone in that class or it shouldn't be there. In terms of uh, the smart meters, the commission has also said for uh, 10 kilowatt plus consumers, even though we don't have TOD right now, the meter should be three phase and uh, so that you don't have to change them in the future as and when TOD uh, tariff structures come into place for, for Maharashtra and they're looking at all utilities. Uh, but uh, as an in industry and commercial has had it in, in Maharashtra for a long time, agriculture, as I already said, is, is already moving to daytime. So the only a uh, big uh, block which is remaining is residential. There we have suggested a stepwise approach that uh, from 20 kilowatt you go down to 10 kilowatt to begin with, and then depending on the experience we can go we can go below. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll invite uh, Ajit and Ajit. You kind of really lead interesting uh, kind of ABCD of kind of uh, designing these tariffs, and I think that is really helpful for uh, thinking through this process. Uh, but uh, based on your experience, uh, some of the states which have already adopted TOD in some form or the other, are those uh, kind of uh, approaches kind of sufficient to uh, development of a green TOD tariff? Means uh, do we need to do something more than what has been done to set up the uh, existing green uh, existing TODs? And the second question is also kind of important uh, here. What we're talking about is providing some incentive uh, to the uh, end user to switch their demand, which means whether uh, it will be acceptable for discom to uh, uh, kind of uh, go for a lower tariff rates during the day when uh, they are also uh, kind of giving this incentive to the consumer classes which are high paying. So uh, whether the discoms will be willing to uh, do that or not. Over. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Anurag, for that question. Uh, in my view, uh, see, looking at TOD in isolation, it will not actually lead, lead us anywhere. Okay, uh, what we have to actually look at is, you know, we have gone to the days we have already started looking at uh, moving from single part to two part tariff in many states, and now even three part tariff that with the wire cost of the willing charges being separate component of the tariff. Uh, we, we are in fact talking about not just three part in some consumer categories, but actually looking at already five part, five component tariff kind of a arrangement with voltage surcharge or you know bulk supply rebate, incremental consumption rebate, PF incentives, load factor incentives, you know. So all these actually uh, would lead to a consumer is going to do his own assessment. Uh, where does the entire TOD rebate or incentive or disincentive fall amongst the all 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 these different components put together? And uh, further as you know, as uh, 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 you know, we, were we were talking about with the real-time market and you know, GTAM and other you know avenues open up, the consumers would definitely try and evaluate all this. So when we are try trying to talk about TOD, uh, we have to think about all the tariff design components and the interplay between each one of this and how the consumer would respond to each one of these signal signals. I think that is something which is very important. Uh, second important thing right now, I think we are uh, discussing more purely from our as is today because we are talking about the solar curve and the solar generation pattern but the green when we discuss green green is not just solar okay we have to have you know when you talk about green we talk about all sorts of in the particularly in the states which are actually best of with you know all types of renewable whether it's a biomass bagasse or wind or you know solar and small hydro and all components of that and each one of them it's got its own resource characteristics of generation and also the seasonality aspect of it so how all that would actually influence from the regulators point of view when they would look at you know to promoting a concept of green tariff or a green TOD, they would need to and should look at in fact integrated and comprehensive manner all sorts of renewable and what it would uh, 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 impact and going a step further i would in fact say that you know we are talking about the consumer with the kind of falling storage cost we are looking at solar plus storage then whatever you had actually designed you know possibly you have a completely different answer uh, coming in. Uh, so that is something that we need to be careful about. So all these, you know, different, you know, uh, in that sense, I really appreciate uh, Ashwin's point about being nimble and dynamic in that sense uh, and be responsive or maybe proactive, not just responsive to proactive in terms of design and allowing the flexibility. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, now uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, comments from uh, Mr. Uh, Sarkar, and uh, if you can kind of uh, elaborate a little more on based on your experience, how the access availability of uh, REs, 
happy during the day and i am hearing a uh and make the case to be the resources at green tod we are kind of catering for the consumers who are kind of shifting away uh, the existing discounts to other resources like going for their open access or installing their own uh, renewable systems so uh, if you have any kind of uh, uh, ियम or on stock going for direct this uh, contract available okay uh, so uh, if i may understand if i have understood correctly your uh, your question is around that uh, if is the green tod tariff can it be deterrent for consumers moving out on open access right okay. yes so see currently uh, the uh, consumers who are moving out on open access and this is what uh, we have seen uh, across uh, all states uh, there are four uh, routes majorly one is the uh, third party bilateral where he has to pay the open access charges uh, the where to pay the willing charges cross subsidy surcharge additional surcharge uh, then uh, re obligation and also many other charges which may be particular to that state which uh, uh, which may not be that much of a loss to the discom if if a uh, person moves on uh, on third party open access uh, uh, in fact the discom will save some of the uh, power procurement cost also similar is with the uh, you know when he moves out on, on procuring power from the exchange however when the consumer moves out on group captive and uh, uh, currently solar uh, group captive is becoming very popular given the fact that solar group captive has the transmission charges uh, relief as well as the ed benefits relief in in some of the states so it's catching up very fast so that actually leads to a loss to the discom in terms of the uh, you know the css loss which happens and also uh, also if uh, if he uh, sets up his uh, own independent solar capacity then the discom uh, uh, loses so so if 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 we uh, we uh, the intent of the discom as i said in my opening remark also should be to retain these consumers from from going out particularly uh, the last two uh, which are actually hurting the discom on the other hand if you see that uh, the discoms uh, many times is in a surplus situation uh, uh, in, as if you look at the uh, re uh, availability is there because uh, always uh, there is a scenario where there is a ex- ex- excess excess uh, you know uh, uh, tie up beyond the rpo requirements then there are excess generation situations uh, and also there is a significant quantum which is coming from the solar roof of the many states which also goes into the grid and it's unscheduled uncontrolled so so there is a there is a uh, excess generation on one side and there is a need for lower tariff on the other side so these two can match very well uh, with the with the uh, uh, with the gtod sort of a concept uh, 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 however uh, you know uh, the, what what we have also seen is that as i was saying that if i may elaborate it little bit more uh, yes. that uh, that uh, you know in fact uh, we are working very closely with some of the uh, consumers uh, to to look at their demand pattern and and someone talked about uh, you know the analytics i think that's a very important part that uh, there has to be a proper analytics uh, done on on the consumption pattern on on his uh, uh, equipment status on his uh, on his uh, production uh, pattern on his uh, delivery pattern on his uh, market uh, behavior pattern so all of this uh, has to be done intrinsically on the demand side on the consumption side of the consumer so uh, uh, you know uh, i don't know we have a slide on that on on esco uh, which we are we are working uh, very closely uh, so uh, see that yeah yeah can you go to the next slide please 
slide number five. Yeah, see if you see here, uh, we are uh, actually uh, the the trader is the the uh, coordination coordinating agency here, and the heart of this is a blockchain, and the blockchain has two three very important uh, criteria. One is it it uh, uh, allows the data and the ledgers and the transactions to be uh, seamlessly shared or visible across many uh, participants or many uh, stakeholders, which is which is an unique advantage which no other technology provides. The other is it can it can uh, help to execute a uh, number of contracts uh, which are immutable and which are uh, called smart contracts. So these two features would help a lot uh, in bringing this uh, uh, this support to the to the uh, consumer side. First is the there has to be a, a, a data science uh, and a, a artificial intelligence based analysis. That, that goes into the uh, blockchain. This analysis is visible to the tra trading uh, entity, the ESCO partner, as well as the clients. Then the ESCO partner and the traders discusses with the clients and decides what all the initiatives or the services are to be provided by the ESCO. In this process, there is also a need for uh, the financing, as I was saying. Uh, the financing also uh, is pulled in by the trader, where the trader brings in the NBFCs who does the financing of uh, of those initiatives or investments which are required to, uh, to be done by the client and and as you can see every interaction every contractual arrangement has two side uh, you know behaviors of, and everything is emanating from the savings which uh, are there uh, on the client side because we are now looking at it from the client's perspective if the client saves something then that saving goes into payments to the data analytics uh, that goes savings goes into the margin to the trader and that savings goes into the paying for the interest charges for the NBFC as also the payments to the ESCO and everybody has a share of that pie uh, including the client and this actually is a model which is is uh, uh, is we we see this is the future there is a tremendous demand for this sort of an arrangement uh, where where all the aspects have been we have thought through that what all can uh, go wrong and what all analysis are required and what all uh, stakeholders have to participate in this uh, and what all platform is required to uh, make everything visible and uh, to get the uh, governance part of it to get the uh, visibility part of it as also to uh, have the contracts and those contracts the um, uh, pay, pay, payments have are also monitored through the blockchain platform so this is one thing which uh, we are working upon uh, large, uh, uh, on a uh, you know as of now it is on a pilot basis but we are trying to see that it, it expands and this actually will help a lot in success of three things one is to uh, ensure that the consumers uh, gets the support to move to a tod uh, uh, regime number two the discoms uh, surplus re power will get properly utilized and and also uh, also the demand curve will get flattened uh, so that will help the power procurement uh, to the discom also so this is what we see can address the open access as well as the retention of the consumers uh, in, in the long run thank you mr Sarkar. and i think this is a really a good example of like how comprehensively you have to work across different elements of consumer engagement use of technology uh, also creating awareness and a structure which can support this. Are, are there any regulatory issues with this uh, uh, kind of a program or, or a pilot? So you have not been to that. See this uh, uh, this program. As I said, we are in a pilot phase. We are implementing it in Delhi and. Uh, uh, then we'll we'll uh, roll it out. Uh, and uh, as I had said, that we are parallelly also working on a demand response uh, program. That is the that is the second uh, incentive uh, to support uh, such movements. And uh, the third thing, which we are also uh, very much uh, seeing a big potential, is to is to work on the subsidized category of the consumers. Now, in our understanding. The subsidized category of consumers have to be given way out to to be self-sustaining so that they do not consume the cross-subsidy part. Uh, uh, and going forward, there is a cross-subsidy rationalization also, which has been proposed in the electricity amendment. So what we are uh, uh, suggesting is that 
uh, a, a, a pro, there should be enablement to set up more and more rooftops and also uh, there is a concept of peer to peer trading which uh, is again uh, something which we are uh, working in a big way and the peer to peer trading enables uh, consumer uh, a person who has set up a rooftop uh, to be a prosumer mix of, mix of pro producer and a consumer so he is a produce prosumer and he consumes part of it today the today almost 25% of the rooftop capacity is being uh, injected into the grid and this is a loss to the uh, to consumers also and uh, although it uh, it addresses the rpo requirement of the of the discom but uh, you know the consumers uh, they in most some of the states there is a appc amount which is paid there is a cut off also beyond which the consumers have to uh, inject the power at zero cost so so there is a big opportunity if we bring in uh, and also if you see there is another set of consumers who do not have the wherewithal to uh, install a solar capacity but they also would like to get benefit of the uh, so the cheaper solar power so it is a win win for bo uh, uh, everyone the uh, discom the uh, uh, prosumer who have set up rooftop and the consumers who have not been able to set up rooftop and there is again a blockchain technology which we are working very closely and this helps to uh, pump in the power to from the prosumer to the consumer directly and uh, so th that uh, helps a proper uh, tariff to be achieved by the uh, prosumer that helps a lower tariff to be achieved by the consumer that also helps uh, a lot of saving uh, um, towards the subsidized consumer base by the discoms and uh, savings in the generation cost transmission cost distribution cost which is highest for residential consumers so all of this is saved uh, but uh, even then we have seen that uh, for every unit uh, which uh, you know is uh, generated from the rooftop and you, there is a saving of about 22 paise we have worked out in in, in delhi there is a uh, economic times report also so this actually uh, is another thing which we wanted to uh, propose, uh, uh, you know, uh, not in the light of the GTOD, but in the light of what uh, Madam Kennedy also mentioned that uh, distributed PV uh, grid connected. So this also would be uh, uh, required to to promote uh, the grid connected uh, distributed solar PV cells to a large extent. OK, uh, thank you, Mr. Sarkar. And uh, we are kind of already over a minute about time, but uh, I still like to go to uh, Vibhuti and ask her the last question before I take up a few uh, questions which have come from the uh, participants. So uh, Vibhuti, uh, uh, based on your experience and the pilot you mentioned, uh, do you have any suggestions on the uh, views on the consumer categories which have a higher kind of a, uh, demand uh, which is elastic to the tariff changes? And uh, have any kind of a sector or subsector specific studies been undertaken on this? And if you can share uh, your kind of work on this. Over. Um, you know, consumers with, I believe, with very high tariff are more likely to shift their demand. Such consumers are also energy intensive. So we have seen the retail tariff of industries and uh, commercial in the, uh, consumers are the highest. And they can provide the highest capacity to shift their demand, uh, followed by then agriculture. Uh, we have already seen a lot of government schemes kind of promoting uh, use of solar agricultural pumps, whether it's uh, the decentralized pumps or through the solar feeders. So uh, they can definitely, uh, you know, uh, take the use of uh, renewable energy that is being available during the day and kind of meet their energy needs uh, during that time. And also, uh, based on the study which we did, you know, it was kind of seen that industries need minimum implementation costs, as most of these have already meters installed. Uh, they need smart meters, and most of them also have gone uh, in installing the smart meters and can share the real-time data. So I think that is very critical in terms of uh, these consumers participating in uh, these kind of mechanisms, uh, whether it can respond to time of day tariff or, you know, uh, other market design principles where uh, they have the ability to shift the demand. 
residential on the other hand you know uh, while the volumes in uh, while the number of consumers are large but in terms of volume uh, they are still low uh, but they do have the ability to quickly respond to such situations and you know um, they can very very easily respond in the real time markets as well whereas industries do need uh, some adjustments uh, in advance and but uh, on the other hand as i said residential consumers though uh, the demand is comparatively low compared to other consumers but now given that uh, um, we are expecting the a uh, lot of uh, studies being conducted to show that you know the ac load is gonna go up so we i feel that you know they can uh, be probably um provide more active and more volume uh, of response by the residential consumers and with this current situation of covid-19 where a lot of people are working from home we have been seeing that the demand from such consumers have gone up uh in terms of study i did mention one of the studies we did with rajasthan which was uh, supported by shakti foundation it's it is available uh, so one can look at that to and it can provide good insights in terms of the different industries and how the different stages uh, of you know uh, of creating the final output is concerned and how different stages have uh, different kind of energy requirements and some of uh, the stages can be kind of you know respond to these situations or uh, instead of maintenance being happening for example in the case of steel industries you know the rolling mills go for maintenance for 5 uh, to 6 hours every day uh, how that kind of a maintenance time can be shifted based on uh, again the tod uh, price signals very recently cpi also came out with some analysis uh, on which can provide good insights again for market designs other than that uh, there were few studies or few uh, pilots that were run by tata power and bscs in delhi and also in mumbai with the residential consumer so yeah there there have been some studies but i think uh, we do need a more detailed assessments of the demand profiles and given that these studies are a bit dated and the uh, the demand profile has changed i think it has to be more dynamic and kind of uh, that assessment needs to be done on a more regular basis thank you kubutu and you actually answered one of the question from the audience who asked like uh, the availability of the load curves for different categories and uh, and you kind of clarified that uh, there are some studies but they are not enough and also a very important point that the uh, demand patterns for the consumer classes are also changing so we need to have more updated information available more frequent to this so uh, uh, in the interest of time uh, i will just take one question uh, from the questions which we received from the audience and i will open it up for any panelists to respond to uh, but before that there was also a suggestion which says that okay uh, they suggesting to work on a simplified structure for green tariff which is easy to understood adopt and adapt for the consumer so i agree to that point uh, so here the question is and it's also related to this remark is that the green tariff uh, tod time slot will simply build another layer of a uh, tariff adoption crisis which the wind hybrid peak power producers are facing through techy and discom so i think the the question is that uh, are we not complicating more by introducing green tariff where we already have so much of these different kinds of uh, tariffs existing and will not be really helpful so uh, i'll invite anybody who is kind of uh, interested in responding to this uh, question yeah yeah maybe i can take a uh, initial dig and probably barat sure. and others right. can join in uh, okay I, i try to you know uh, you know make make that point that you know the uh, life is going to be a more complex uh, henceforth with having lot more variability both at demand side and supply side and the kind of component that we're looking at is not just three part component you know multi part component Uh, which are there, and uh, you know we are going to hold the licensee more and more responsible even for a uh, uh, balancing cost, and we are going to have a, a intra-state uh, you know volume limit, sign change, and all those things. So this variability management is going to be an important issue for the utility, and.
and that would get reflected also in terms of you know uh, overall you know that is basically pricing for the service and for the uh, offering that uh, one would need to look at so uh, but i'm sure with the you know kind of you know solutions the it and iot solutions that we have in place uh, uh, the things would be you know at least there will be more data driven you know decision making for the consumers and it won't be that you know difficult uh, going forward that's but obviously the there is no substitute for the hard work and for the studies uh, that we're talking about and possibly a pilot studies uh, before introducing any such framework would be uh, definitely a uh, good way to move forward thank you ajit anybody else i just yeah i can i mean i just sort of i think the the question sort of uh, assumes that you know things are static and that uh, the group of people coming and complicating things right. I, I, and i think actually that's not the right not, the, the assumption is is sort of wrong because things are actually quite uh, crazy things are moving so rapidly in terms of technology in terms of the uh, the performance of of technologies in terms of who can generate what the cost is how do what is regulation i mean so many things are changing so I think uh, what is um, uh, needed, and un unfortunately, this is again not like before when we could just look back, look at you know what we did 20 years ago, and say, okay, well, let's pull out something we did from then. This is about looking, you know, trying to make decisions for tomorrow with the kind of knowledge and information we have uh, today. Uh, so uh, I, I guess it will be complicated. It will be a bit messy. That's what transitions are. They are unlikely to be linear you know nice little sort of steps that we just climb up it is going to be a bit like snakes and ladders uh, uh, where you know it, it there will be periods of time where we'll see sort of bursts in in one direction there could be changes so i think that's really how we have to approach it uh, uh, recognizing that things are moving quite rapidly thanks uh, yeah. can i make a brief point anra this is uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, Bharat and uh, Prayas and uh, WR and Prayas, we had uh, co-authored a report on uh, the future of the grid. And one of the, uh, this was 2016, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the things we had uh, foreseen sort of was uh, that, you know, the, the discoms would move away from just selling energy to grid services. And the point made earlier, the blockchain uh, example is exactly that, you know, you're aggregating and you're not just you're moving away from selling simply kilowatt hours. So one step is you sell differentiated kilowatt hours by time of day or time of season. But even going beyond, as Bharat said, as Ajit said, you know, life is not going to get simpler. You are going to get more and more services like reliability, backup and uh, sort of each of them being valued uh, for what it is. Uh, they may not be priced separately. There could be some combining because you don't want 10 line items in your bill, but uh, you know it's not going to get any easier and you're going to see discoms moving away from just selling energy to, to grid services. Yeah. Thanks, Ashwin. And a very important point. I think this is also not just uh, technologies aiding the decision making, but also can for third party service providers or aggregators can also kind of a play a very important role. And I think most of the panelists also mentioned that just introducing tariff will not be sufficient. You also have to have a support system to kind of enable the use of these tariffs. So uh, I take that point. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to kind of uh, thank all the panelists here uh, for your uh, kind of uh, suggestions and thoughts. Uh, we, we learned a lot and I think uh, this is something which uh, the PhD team is taking notes and we'll be uh, taking these uh, kind of uh, suggestions in, in the design for the state for Assam and uh, Jharkhand. And uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Yobita for the closing. Uh, but again, uh, thank all the panelists uh, for your inputs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the great discussions we all had here. Uh, with this, uh, we now come to an end of the webinar. And I would like to invite Dr. Rakesh Goel, team leader, PC 2.0 RE program, to give his uh, concluding remarks. Thank you, Yogita. Good afternoon to all, and thank you. We have already exceeded the time. I will just make one general comment, and then to the honor of thanking all. The advancement in technology and communication are making us think about re-engineering the two important aspects of the power sector, power system operation and retail tariff design. Previously in power system operations, demand was considered uncontrollable and was managed 
by cutting and cut out of the feeders. Only the supply was controllable and stable. Now the situation is reversed. Now the supply sources have become variable and uncontrollable due to RE, but it is possible to regulate demand by energy efficiency, demand response, and pricing signals. The price signal is the retail tariff design is most important tool to manage demand variation. The retail tariff historically was based on non-optimic parameters in spite of the objective to price electricity economically. One of the key reasons for this was technological difficulties in recording demand and supply availability at the time of consumption for every consumer. Since technological advancement have addressed this issue, focus should be on the retail tariff design based on first principle of economics that the intersection of demand and supply should be the tariff of the exit. In view of, however, other consideration of retail tariff design such as consumer acceptability, the economic pricing of electricity will continue to be a journey. Today's webinar of Green TOD Tariff is one such a step from our side towards this direction. We hope in times to come, government, discoms, and regulatory commissions will design tariff based on availability of supply and demand in that particular time block of 15 minutes or maybe five minutes later. With this general comment, we are thankful to Ms. Julia and Mr. Anurag Mishra from USA for providing us the opportunity to conduct this webinar. And double thank to Mr. Anurag Mishra for moderating the session also. We are thankful to Mr. Anand Kumar, Chairman GERC, for sparing time and sharing several pioneering regulatory approaches adopted in Gujarat to accommodate higher RE into the system. Probably, Gujarat will be the first state soon to introduce time variant demand charges in India. We are thankful to all the panelists, Mr. Bhaskar Sarkar, Mr. Ajit Pandit, Mr. Jairaj, Mr. Ashwin, and Ms. Vibhuti for sparing their time and sharing very, very valuable thoughts. And as Anurag pointed out, will help us in implementing or designing the green QD for our partner states. We are also thankful to Mr. Ranjit for making the introductory presentation. I like to thank PSD 2.0 RE team also, and will particularly like to mention two person, Mr. Ronnie Khanna and Ms. Yogita Sharma, who had worked very, very hard to make this webinar successful. We thank all the participants from India and various other geographies I've seen which they participated in this webinar for contributing their thoughts, provoking questions. We will be answering all the questions that we get. We could not answer because of the paucity of time uh, on the individual basis. Thank you and goodbye. Yogita, do you have any concluding or is this ends? Um, yeah, I just wanted to share one housekeeping item that uh, we'll be sharing follow up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar and um, a, a survey link also uh, to get your feedback on this webinar. Thank you to all. Thank you, everyone.